presentations um, doing a land acknowledgement, which is a common practice in a lot of activist circles, particularly in Canada and Australia, and we like to continue that practice and hopefully it'll catch on in other circles here. Um, so I'd like to take a moment and recognize that we're sitting on stolen colonized land right now. That's a part of history, but also something that occurs today. Um, so I'd like to contextualize all those stories with where we're sitting right now and how we came to sit here. Um, so has anybody ever been to a Beehive presentation before? Awesome. Cool. How many of y'all were here the last time we were in this presentation? Oh, okay. all right. Cool. <laughs> um, well, for folks who might not be as familiar with the Beehive, um, we are a collective of folks with all kinds of different skills. Um, we are artists and illustrators. We're also activists and educators, printers, um, cooks, um, people who come together in all types of ways to make these giant graphics happen, um, which we use as storytelling and educational tools. Um, so all of our graphics are anti-copyright, so you can take our graphics and use them however you want to use them. Um, this is particularly useful for educators who are trying to organize and want to use um, visuals and cartoons to explain their ideas, or even folks use them for graphics to promote marches and things like that. Um, so we have one sort of base that's in Machias, Maine, but we're a very decentralized organization. Um, we do have a local component to our work uh, where we do these restoration projects in the town that we live in. Right now we're in the process of restoring two spaces. One is going to be a community kitchen in that town, and um, the other one is going to be sort of like a multi-purpose organizing space, an art space uh, for folks living there. So these are kind of the two global and local components of us. Um, all of these graphics are made collectively. Um, so this particular graphic took nine years to make. Um, it also took around 13 illustrators and many, many other people who contributed in many ways, including research, um, brainstorming, as well as keeping folks happy. Um, so all of our graphics are done in a similar collective style, and that's also part of what makes them so special. And I think we were asked to say our names. My name's oh, Emma. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Althea. <laughs> and this, Seth. this is Steph. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we all work with the Beehive Collective. And Steph lives in Providence, so she's not on the tour with us right now, but she still knows a lot about the Beehive and is here to be part of it tonight. Um, but yeah, so this graphic is called Mesoamerica Resiste, and it's the third in a trilogy about globalization in Latin America. And you can see examples of the first two up in the back uh, later when you're prowling around near the snack table. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this graphic is actually a two-sided graphic. So the front is drawn in the style of an old conquistador's map. And it shows a world view. Um, it shows a view of Mesoamerica, which is from southern Mexico down to Panama. Um, but it also just more generally shows a world view that's very top down, that's very much um, about making profit. Profit is the most important thing on this map. And then over here, when we open the map, we see an entirely different perspective of the same region drawn from the perspective maybe of a little ant standing on the roots of this massive seba tree. And this perspective values life and health and community and um, diversity much more than it values any sort of accumulation of wealth. And so, um, so we're going to, tonight, we're going to be letting you know, we're going to be, Althea and I will share some of the stories from this graphic. Um, and we're also going to have a lot of conversation and discussion. And at one point, we're going to hand out scenes and have you guys look at those scenes and sort of decipher the metaphors yourself. And we'll, and we'll 
integrate that with our storytelling. Um, but so these stories that I'm mentioning, this graphic began with a six month listening trip from Mexico all the way down into Colombia to listen to stories from communities that were being impacted by mega projects, um, by this massive grid of highways and electric grids and big dams and oil pipelines, um, canals. And all of these projects are being built as part of something called Plan Mesoamerica. So what we see on this map are like on an old world map, you would have um, somebody in the clouds with puffy cheeks blowing the boats across the ocean. And so here, the, the trade winds um, are also showing us the pressures on this region. So coming in here, we have a storm coming in from the east, from Asia, of cheap manufactured goods. We have laptops and shoes and SpongeBob square pants rolling in on a conveyor belt, getting his pants snapped on. Um, and so all of these cheap goods are getting, um, getting blown across this region and sucked up in this tornado, this vacuum cleaner of consumption in North America and Europe. And so that's one of the major um, reasons for this infrastructure grid is to facilitate the movement of goods through this region. It's the tiny strip of land that separates the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans and connects South and North America. So it's sort of this epicenter of global trade routes. And that's one of the reasons why this piece of land is so highly coveted, uh, especially by, by multinational corporations who want to get their goods through more cheaply, more efficiently, but also because this strip of land is incredibly diverse. There are a ton of minerals and fresh water and um, like all sorts of features of this landscape that are considered to be resources by this worldview, that are considered to be things to make a profit on. And the people living in this region as well are also, um, you know, in this worldview are also considered resources and their cultures are considered commodities. So from maquiladoras, factories, sweatshop zones, um, to the exploitation by the tourism industry, this whole region is just very highly coveted. Um, it's sort of this, like, um, what do we call it? What's the metaphor I'm going for here? <laughs> It's both the linchpin and the Achilles heel of global trade. Thank you. We've been really into this concept <laughs> lately. <laughs> um, but yeah, because it is um, so significant in terms of those trade routes and the Panama Canal is here, that control of this region and making a huge grid to more easily exploit it is why it's sort of this linchpin. But it's the Achilles heel because this region also has an incredibly strong um, current and historical resistance to this kind of exploitation. And so there are amazing social movements throughout this region and um, a very strong culture of resistance, which we're going to dive into when we start talking about the center of the graphic in a little while. But you can see that the pipelines and the roads are pouring out of this cash drawer attached to a conquistador cash register. And in one hand, these little finger puppet governments with comb overs and handlebar mustaches and very serious blank expressions. These are the puppet governments that are shaking down a line of paper doll people, the taxpayers of this region, to get their money to put into these infrastructure projects through um, often through debt that the state takes on. Um, this, this conquistador cash register is the Inter-American Development Bank. It's one of the major funders of Plan Mesoamerica, and it's the regional arm of the World Bank. And just as on an old world map, you would have the monarchs in the corners. There would be portraits of whoever was funding this particular conquest. In the corners of our graphic, we have these major global institutions that are not only funding this project through loans, through debt, 
um, but also are sort of pushing forward this economic worldview worldwide. So on the belly of the cash register, we have NAFTA, and the C is switching over to CAFTA. So this is the North American Free Trade Agreement extending down through Central America and the Central American Free Trade Agreement. And this is the policy arm, whereas Plan Mesoamerica is the infrastructure arm. These free trade agreements are the policy side of this worldview. And so we want to take a moment to ask the room, um, what associations do you have with this concept of free trade? What's it all about? Shout out, whatever's in your brain. We have plenty of them. You want to say more about that? Uh, sure, it's a pretext to continue the extraction of resources from poor nations in the global south, just as it was happening during proper colonial days. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Voiding regulation. Mm. Do you want to speak any more about that? Yeah, like, uh, companies that are supplying goods to, the, to North America are they move to other places where they don't have to abide by the same labor or environmental regulations. Mm -hmm. Goods can move around, but people can't. Mm -hmm. So people are penned into like separated work camps. Those are definitely <coughs> some of the major characteristics of, um, of free trade and of this whole economic agenda. Also, privatization is a big piece of that. And, um, and reorienting economies from producing things that they need within their countries to producing cash crops for export, changing from local ownership to corporate ownership. And down here, we have a compass rose which on a map, like Columbus might have used to get lost in the Atlantic Ocean, there would have been a needle pointing north to sort of show how to plan a course. But in this compass rose, um, the needle is pointing, it's showing us where the power lies in this view of the world, this map. And it's actually with these two ladies, these two mermaids. Starbucks yeah. logo and Chiquita. Yeah, Chiquita. <laughs> Starbucks and Chiquita are our mermaids of capitalism, holding up this compass rose and playing roulette. Um, this is actually a roulette table. They're spinning it around, gambling with the economies of this region and playing with people's lives. Below them, we have trains and tanks and guns. And this is talking about how um, banana and coffee are two industries um, that have been responsible for a ton of militarization throughout this region over the years. For example, in the 1950s, uh, Chiquita Banana, then United Fruit Company, owned a lot of land in plantations in Guatemala, and a democratically elected government wanted to redistribute land to Guatemalan farmers. So the CIA intervened on behalf of Chiquita, on behalf of this U.S.-owned corporation, to overthrow that government, they sent down weapons and military support and kicked off many decades of civil war. And so that's just one example among many um, that sort of orient us to this worldview where profit takes precedence over life, over all else. This compass is also directing all these ships that you see traveling all around the map. Um, for example, um, these ships are representing different industries that are benefiting from this type of trade and that are getting pushed around by these power dynamics. Um, in particular, you have um, these three ships over here, which are representing um, a historical trade route called the Triangle Slave Trade. Is anybody familiar with this trade route? Do you want to speak to it? Um, my understanding of it is that there was a triangle set up between the Caribbean, the U.S., or the so-called U.S., and Africa. Um, and certain things went to the U.S., and then the slaves. Certain things went to the Caribbean. I'm not sure what got traded down that way. And then sugar went 
Okay. Yeah. It's this combination of slaves and sugar. So Christopher Columbus was actually the first person to bring sugarcane plants over to areas like the Caribbean. And so sugar plantations were started. And um, what would happen is sugar was grown, and then sugar would be brought to Europe and made into um, rum. And then rum would be brought over to Africa. And oftentimes that rum would even be used to not only trade for slaves, but also to sway leaders of communities there into giving slaves to Europeans. And those slaves would then complete the triangle by coming back into working at the sugar plantations to produce the actual sugar that's going to complete this triangle. So we have here pictured this historical trade route. We have this ship here, which is filled with slaves. Um, we have this ship over here uh, representing sugar with spoons for oars, spooning the sugar as it paddles across the ocean. And over here we have a ship that's filled with stolen wealth that made this trade possible. So you have all these um, beautiful sort of um, sculptures made from gold which are then being melted down into gold bars to be used as capital later in Europe um, at the bottom of the ship. But on all three of these ships, there are also modern interpretations of this. Um, for example, at the bottom, on top of the slave trade, on top of the masts are panopticons. They have panopticons and security cameras that are coming down and chains that are holding up the masts. And this is a reference to um, the similarities between slavery and the modern prison industry not only in ways of the way the racist nature of who gets prosecuted and incarcerated these days but also the use of prison labor in the production of many products including um, the mermaid starbucks over here often uses prison labor to package different types of their coffees um, on the sugar ship you have giant king kool-aid at the top and also on the masts you have cupcakes and cavity filled teeth the legacy of sugar um, and finally, um, where these ancient relics are being melted down into gold bars, you have masks with sails that all have the logos of modern day banks, uh, referencing the way that these banks and the wealth that occurs in these days is built on the back of that stolen wealth and historic trade routes and colonization of this day. Um, you also have down here another celebration of this type of wealth. Um, Emma, do you want to help me hold this up so yeah. people in the back can really see? Um, at the very bottom of this entire map is a table, and you have these weird creatures that are sitting at the very bottom, and they're all there's five of them, but they're all wearing animal masks because they're trying to tell you that they're friendly and that they have a, a human and animal face. Um, <coughs> but behind their masks are um, the tools of their industries. You have golf clubs talking about tourism. You have um, an oil um, creature, you have timber, you have pharmaceuticals, you have bottled water. And each one of them has their own extractive claw. And so, for example, the tourism has a sandal that they're using. Um, the timber has a chainsaw. The pharmaceutical company has a <coughs> syringe. And the bottled water company has a water tap. And they're using their extractive claws to cut up this cake. And the cake is in the shape of Mesoamerica. And so they're using their claws and they're dividing up this cake because they're deciding what's going to happen to this piece of land based on what they're going to extract from it. And on top of this cake are candles. They're celebrating their 500th birthday of colonization and um, celebrating it with a fat slice of that cake of land. Um, at the bottom of this table is a picture, a reference to Noah's Ark because uh, as you saw, they have animal masks, and so they're also conservation friendly. They're saving two of every species so that none will go extinct. But this is like a tokenized version of their ideas of conservation, where they're only saving just enough so that they'll survive and not including many diversities, only pairs of two. And as these species are being saved, they're all being hidden again underneath their table, and so they're hoarding the control over these species. Um, another approach to conservation that they have is um, the tourism monster over here is having a photo shoot. And so he's taking a picture using this billboard, and the billboard has um, a very racist and tokenized version cartoon of an indigenous person. And the, 
cartoon has their thumbs up as if everything's going real well. And there's a head cut out so that a bee can stick their head in and take their photo with it, just like at a tourist attraction. But what's going on behind this billboard is there's this big greenhouse. And this greenhouse is a reference to these biological corridors that were at one time part of this plan, where um, certain areas would be designated for conservation. But what ends up happening is when these areas are designated for conservation, they ignore many of the indigenous people that have occupied that land and kept it conserved for many, many years. So over here you have this big boot and it's kicking out all the native bees out the back door. You also have inside this, um, you have this small frog that's at the very top of the glass and it has its little suction cup feet trying to get out. Um, and this same frog is actually pictured on the billboard as well, but on the billboard they're smiling. And so this is also talking about um, through <coughs> containing what areas are going to be in conservation, this often offers more control over those areas. It also gives a power of these corporations to manage them. So oftentimes in these areas of conservation, things like mining and extracting water can still happen in these areas despite them being environmentally conserved. Yeah. yeah. So you have this big figure of the World Bank that's playing chess on the other side. And so the World Bank is putting its tokens, it's actually making all these poker chips that are going into all these pieces out of the pollution that's coming out of its head. Um, and it's putting its tokens into these dirty energies. But you'll realize that it's just the same thing where the same companies are investing into dirty energies as will be investing into clean ones. And so the World Bank knows this. And so the World Bank actually has, um, on top of its smokestack top hat, it also has a halo made of an LED light bulb, telling you that it's green. <laughs> so, can we have a time check? Does somebody know what time it is? 7.41. 7.41. Maybe we should move on. Can we have until... I kind of want to tell you what to do. Can you do it? Oh, Emma. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, oh, sorry. Um, so, on this worldview, we can hardly see anything living, right? It's so far removed from reality, so up here in economic theory, that there aren't really many images of, of human stories or plants or animals or ecosystems living in this, in this image. Those are pushed to the margins. They're still here, but they're just sort of like pushed over to the edge. And we're gonna check out some of these cycles. Um, this particular cycle is talking about the relationship between militarism and industrial agriculture. Um, we have two waves of ants coming up. We have a wave of ants protesting with megaphones, um, with signs that say fuera militares, out with the military, or la tierra no se vende, this land is not for sale. They're protesting to keep their, to keep their land, but um, these riot cops are marching them down into a mass grave. This is talking about a repression like we saw in Guatemala, um, like we discussed with Chiquita Banana in the 50s. Um, scorched earth policies that, that come down and repress movements for, um, by land-based farmers. And so we have this tank tractor down below that has all sorts of um, melding of technology, of war technology with industrial agricultural technology. This is talking about how, especially after World War II, there were so many um, factories to produce tanks and tools of war and also companies that had manufactured chemical weapons like Agent Orange and Napalm. And those technologies got converted after the war into agricultural technologies. So, um, you know, like Monsanto started producing pesticides with those chemicals, for example, and those factories started producing tractors. And as we come down, we have this Trojan horse of false solutions. It's made up of different oil company logos and um, agricultural company logos like Monsanto 
and Syngenta and Archer Daniel Archer Daniels Miller and Chevron and Shell is the mane of the horse. And marching out of the side, we have um, a line of corn with these conquistador helmets. They're conquistadors. Their kernels are in perfectly straight rows. They've been genetically modified to be all the same, and they don't reproduce. These are terminator seeds. Um, if you plant them, you've got to buy new seeds every year instead of saving them. And these corns are carrying, they're carrying guns, they're carrying um, gas nozzles and chainsaws, syringes, and they're attacking and tearing up by the roots this row of different species of corn that are indigenous to Mesoamerica. They're spraying them with genetic contamination talking about the way that these um, genetically modified seeds cross-pollinate with other crops. Now Monsanto's even suing farmers who have fields nearby their fields because that, that, um, those seeds are patented, that actual that DNA is patented. And it's also mirroring the process of colonization, right? this process of genocide that has long preceded the practice of genetic modification. Down below, we have a scene of ants um, continuing, despite this repression, to practice their agricultural traditions, to grow corn and harvest it and dry it and grind it and make tortillas with it. Um, but this conquistador has its gas nozzle, gas nozzle up to the head of the, um, of the ant, <coughs> taking away its corn. This is talking about how, um, how land is being grabbed away from subsistence farmers to be used to produce ethanol, right, to make fuel or to produce other mass, um, other monocrops. And genetic modification, this Trojan horse is painted as this solution to world hunger and a solution to our dependence on fossil fuels. But we can see the effects of it are, that's actually very much a facade like most things on the front of this, are a facade. So um, in stark contrast to um, the front of the graphic, we're going to sort of transition to this. I know that this kind of requires some like shifting people. <laughs> Come over here. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> we're this side of the graphic is absolutely teeming with life. You'll notice all the borders are sort of bursting with diversity. And actually, um, there are actually 400 different species of plants and animals that are depicted in this graphic, which really just shows you the incredible amount of diversity that's going on um, in this region. Um, and it's all focused around this giant tree that comes down from the top and all the roots spread out and they sort of form these borders to these different scenes that are going on. And so this giant tree is a Saba tree. And the Saba tree is considered to be a tree of life um, in many parts of this region. And so this is a metaphor for a way of looking at the world. A way of looking at the world where you can see all the diversity that's happening around it. You can see people's faces, you can see the types of plants that are growing. And it's one that's literally based around life. It's growing around life and prosperity as opposed to what we were looking at over here, a worldview that's based on profit. Um, so there are many different elements of this. For example, there's a stream of ghostly animals that um, runs up at the top. And actually, all the species that are depicted in this stream have it either been at one point endangered or extinct. And in the nine years that it took to complete this graphic, many of these species actually went from endangered to extinct in just under a decade. Um, so this giant stream sort of runs over the top of everything, and it's symbolic of ancestors. It's symbolic of histories. And so this comes from when bees were um, down on this listening trip listening to folks tell stories. Something that was said over and over again is that you have to remember that these stories are not new. This is something that has been happen happening for many, many years. And you can't think about what's going on now without taking into account what's happened in the past. And so you'll notice that also in all of the scenes, we include a reference to ancestors in many different ways. For example, um, 
can use the skeletons of dinosaurs or prehistoric animals um, to represent ancestors being present in all of these different moments. You also have um, this part of the graphic is many stories of resistance. And so you have streaming down from the top of the Seba tree all these ants. And the beehive really likes to use the metaphor of ants. And am I want you to tell me some of the new facts that you learned last night? <laughs> <laughs> I think I can't remember. You don't okay. But we do know this one really cool fact where if all the ants were put together, their biomass would equal to be more than that of any other species in the world, including humans. Yeah. And we just learned that that's actually between 15 to 25 percent of total biomass on Earth. Yeah. Just ants. This is what we learned last time. So there's a lot of ants. <laughs> so they're a great metaphor for powerful social movements. Yeah, they're a great metaphor for powerful social movements. Also, um, every one of the ants that are drawn throughout this entire thing is a different species of ant. So the incredible diversity of ants themselves is also amazing in the ways that they can work together in different ways to lift up many times their body weights. Um, so you have these ants that are really just streaming down in the stream and holding up the Mesoamerica Resiste banner. And so all throughout this graphic are different stories of resistance and also um, you have these sort of invasions going on of different phenomena that are hopping onto the side of the graphic from the front, which are kind of like demarked by these different stylistic uses. So for example, the invasions are drawn in really harsh black and white lines as opposed to this more like sepia organic style. And so we're going to do this really fun activity where um, we're going to hand out some cutout scenes of parts of this. And so this cartoon is like incredibly detailed. And there are these little tiny pieces that all have, are so rich with metaphor and meaning. So we want to give you all a chance to really like look at one part of it and really stare at it for a long time so you can really soak in all the details that are going on. And so you'll notice that the beehive only uses plants and animals um, or accessories to depict these stories. And so I want to kind of just have a brief discussion with everybody. Why do you think we do that? As opposed to depicting humor. Mm -hmm. It's not only about us. <laughs> what was that? It's not only about us. Mm. We have this really human-centered way of looking at the world, um, when really we're one species and not one I don't know if there's anybody that wants to talk in back because I can't see over the poster. <laughs> but I'll give y'all an opportunity no. now. <laughs> yeah. Because it's also about us, uh, by not depicting us, you're highlighting how we're not different from the, the rest of nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are all really valid reasons, and I want you to kind of like think about them as you're using the scenes and like translating these metaphors into words. Um, so we're gonna hand out some scenes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I was thinking about how Jamaica Plain, the neighborhood that we're in, has changed a lot in the past five, ten years, um, and how a lot of those changes have pushed out a lot of the folks who have called this this neighborhood home for a really long time, um, and how we can almost acknowledge that we uh, are standing on stolen land in a different way. And I also would like to recognize that I say that as um, a person coming from a place of privilege as a white, upper middle class, female bodied person who's able bodied as well. Um, so if anyone 
Um, in other graphics, like our true cost of coal graphic, for example, um, there was a lot more of sort of a direct relationship maintained throughout the course of the graphic process where the same communities were visited again and again with different drafts. Um, so it's, it's different for every graphics campaign. But yeah, there is a process of feedback. And there were a lot of revisions made to this graphic based on that feedback and other feedback that comes from other, um, other folks who weren't necessarily the ones who, like, you know, a lot of these scenes are very general stories as well as very specific stories. So a lot of them are compilations of a lot of different voices and a lot of different people. Can I share one more example of that? Because somebody else pointed that out when they were, they pointed out an example of that um, in this scene of women on the front lines is um, somebody was talking about how all the different um, forms of militarization are represented and how they all look different. Um, I forget who said that. Maybe, maybe it was you, actually. <laughs> um, and so that was a moment where there was a revision made out of when the Beehive originally drew the scene, they all looked sort of like generic soldiers. And uh, they were like drawing sketches on the research trip and folks were telling those stories and were sharing their experiences with that were like, that's not right. It comes in so many different forms and militarization looks different all the time. And so that was like a learning moment and an example of a really intense revision that had to happen where all of these different forms of militarization were then depicted and something that wouldn't have been known to the beehive if there wasn't that like reciprocation process. Can you talk about what the different represented forms of military militarization are? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, we have um, a paramilitary, like a plain clothes paramilitary over here. We have a um, a drug cartel, the militarized riot cop. This character, you can hardly even see its face. It's hidden. This is a, like a private um, private contractor for some security firm like Blackwater. Um, and so it's kind of hidden because it's not even officially counted in numbers in militarization, but these, these private corporations are still carrying out military style actions. Over here we have a death squad probably trained at School of the Americas. <laughs> Next to that character, we have a high-tech soldier from the north and a lower-tech soldier from the south. We give a lot of them away for free, especially in the region where the stories came from. Um, and like, people are horrified when they see our originals <laughs> hanging in this construction zone with lead paint everywhere, hanging by like little binder clips on a piece of plywood. <laughs> like, it's like, um, we really should preserve them a little better. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> the other ones are in storage. Yeah, the other ones are in storage. <laughs> so the other ones are on display at Plymouth State oh, University oh, right now. But they're about a third of this size. Both of the pieces are about a third of the size you see. Oh, okay. Are these the actual size? No, the originals are about a third of this size. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So I think that we might kind of wrap it up. Um, Emma and I will be around like cleaning up and packing our stuff up so, and the staff as well. Um, and you can feel free to ask us questions while we're doing that. And also, all the posters are available for donation in the back and on our web store. And we have a lot of other posters as well. And we're, and in, we're a mostly volunteer organization and funded entirely through donations. So we appreciate um, Yeah, if you want to make a donation, you can in the back. And thanks for the space for hosting this presentation. Thank you so much. We especially thank you. <laughs>